was first, I first presented at the QNU conference last year. And it's about how the Mid Staffordshire scandal, which some of you will know about, its ramifications for Australian nursing, and they are profound. But I'll start by saying I think Australia has one of the best healthcare systems in the world. I've worked in a lot of places, including the UK, Ireland, the Nordic countries, various developing countries. I think Sweden probably has the best healthcare system in the world, certainly in my experience, and perhaps we're not quite up there with Sweden, but we are pretty close. We are very fortunate that we've got the public-private divide because one supports the other. We've got a choice. We've got the best services available free when we need them and if we need them. We also have some of the world's best nurses. And people are very negative about the Australian healthcare system and I think we as a profession are very negative about nursing in Australia. And I think we do not need to be. In fact, we shouldn't be. We are some of the world's leaders in nursing and I don't think Australia and Australians or Australian nurses recognise that. We really are fantastic. And I'm not just here to give you a pep talk about how good we are but we really do have some of the best nursing in the world, the highest standards in education, the highest standards in research, and the highest standards in clinical practice. We are up there with the best of them. And so we must never, ever lose sight of that. And we must always be very grateful for the fantastic healthcare system that we've got. And when I say be very grateful, that means be prepared to fight for it because there's things happening that could erode that. And one of the things that's having an impact around the world at the moment is um, the unknown that's coming out of this major scandal in the National Health Service in the UK. And I think we have to be aware of that unknown and the influence it's going to have here. Now, the Mid-Staffordshire scandal is based around this hospital, which is the, the Mid-Staffordshire, the, the, the main hospital in Stafford, and there's another sister hospital close by. The, um, the whole scandal blew up when there were, a, or became, came to um, notice when there were death rates worked out by the various auditing bodies in Britain at this hospital that were much higher than the national average. So people started to say what's going on. They estimate, nobody's quite sure of the figures, but they estimate about 1,300 people died unnecessarily at this hospital. So in 2007, the Health Care Commission, which is the thing that overlooks all healthcare in the UK, became aware of these high mortality rates for specific conditions. 103 patients and relatives contacted the Health Care Commission and 99 were critical of or had had a poor experience in the Mid-Staffordshire Trust. I'll point out that in the UK, most of you will know this, but in the UK, uh, the health service areas or uh, health service divisions are called trusts. Um, the main areas of concern in Mid-Staffordshire were accident and emergency, the emergency assessment unit and three medical and some surgical wards and major concerns of patients and relatives related to the poor standard of nursing care. The Health Care Commission set up an inquiry and interviewed staff, relatives, patients. It made observations, it reviewed case notes, looked at complaints, <laughs> looked at trust documents and external reports. And in March 2009, published a report into the severe failings in emergency care provided by Mid Staffordshire NHS Foundation Trust between 2005 and 2008. Now, the word foundation, the term foundation trust, is one that uh, needs expl explaining. The NHS trusts were all centrally regulated and centrally governed until they came up with the idea of setting up these foundation trusts. And various trusts around the UK applied for foundation status. To get foundation status would mean that they could work autonomously, they weren't subject to all the central control from London, and that they were um, able to manage their own budgets autonomously. And that's more or less 
the, it was much more complicated than that, but that was more or less the, the essence of, of what foundation trusts were about. So a lot of the trusts saw that that was, uh, thought that was a good idea. So they had to go through various hoops to reach foundation trust status. In fact, there was quite a lot of hoops they had to go through to reach foundation trust status. Now, after that Health Care Commission report, there were two supplemental reviews. Uh, Professor Sir George Alberti, National Clinical Director for Emergency Care, looked at procedures for emergency admissions and treatment and progress against the recommendations of the report, of the Health Care Commission's report. And Dr David Colin Tome, the National Clinical Director for Primary Care, looked at how commissioning and performance management system failed to expose what was happening. These are all publicly available documents. You can Google them up, they come. Now, the Health Care Commission found that when patients were admitted to medical wards, and this is out of their report, there was poor communication and handover. In the acute coronary care unit, there were problems with monitors. There was a lack of beds on the coronary unit, and some heart attack patients were nursed in the um, emergency assessment unit or in non-specialist areas. The clinical areas were poorly managed and understaffed. Call bells for pain or toilet often not answered, medications not given, patients left for hours in wet and soiled sheets. And actually, if you read some of the reports, it says things like the nurses told the patients to do it in the bed because they didn't have time to get them a bedpan. <coughs> Excuse me. The wards, bathrooms and commodes weren't clean. Nurses failed to conduct observations and recognise deterioration. Or they, if they did, they didn't do anything about the results that they found. Um, there were serious incidents involving the contents of resuscitation trolleys and the alarm system for cardiac arrests didn't work effectively. In the surgical wards for emergencies, staff did not have the right training and skills. Surgeons didn't work well together. What's new about that? Uh, there were a few agreed protocols. There weren't enough doctors out of hours. There was no trauma team. Nurses didn't have the right training for traumatic injuries. There was no traction or specialist hoists available. Too, too few staff to open critical care beds. No system to assign priority to cases, so no triaging system. Patients could be nil by mouth for very long periods. There were cases of DVT um, found, but there was no way to meet the accepted guidelines for pre preventing those cases. <clears throat> the post-op care was poor. Deterioration was Mr. Ignored, and the trust was poor at recognising errors, reporting serious incidents, and learning lessons. And it goes on. In the accident and emergency unit, there were no clear protocols. A&E understaffed and poorly equipped. Too few nurses. The screening was done by receptionists. Patients in the waiting room couldn't be seen from reception. They lacked essential equipment, for example, defibrillators. Not enough training and development for the nurses and with weak leadership. Patients waited for medication, pain relief, and dressings, delays in scanning patients out of hours. Senior surgical doctor after 9pm was junior and inexperienced, too few consultants, too few middle grade doctors, and junior doctors were not supervised. And the four hour rule reigned supreme in the UK and the NHS. So there was pressure to make decisions quickly and people were actually told they'd lose their jobs if they didn't get patients out of the emergency department within four hours. Um, patients were rushed from A&E to the emergency assessment unit with no proper assessment or diagnosis. The EAU was large and couldn't, you couldn't see the patients. It was busy, chaotic, understaffed. Poor communication between nurses and patients and nurses and doctors. Nurses, again, had little in-service training. Not all nurses had correct skills. Nurses were not trained to read cardiac monitors and sometimes they were turned off. Observations not carried out properly. Incorrect medication and low standards of infection control. If you read the report, it's like reading a nightmare. It really is. That's just the first report. There was very poor governance. This is one of the conclusions of the Health Care Commission report, that there was poor governance within the trust. Issues required consideration and resolution at the strategic level, but were rarely considered by the board or by its governance and risk subcommittees. There was no systematic mechanism to follow up any actions required or to share lessons, and there was poor clinical audit. The conclusion of the Health Care Commission report, meeting targets was more important than patient care, there was too much focus on finances to the detriment of critical clinical care, little or no attention to clinical outcomes, 
inadequate supervision of services by the board, poor clinical engagement and chronic understaffing. Now, that was the Health Care Commission. The Alberti Review was largely about medical services. They found that nursing was understaffed. They looked, while well, it was about medical services, they looked, they looked a lot at nursing, so nursing was understaffed. They said at present half the nursing force in the trust was healthcare assistants. Now these people are called and seen and perceived to be nurses, but nobody realises that they're not. The Alberti Review recommended that they have six registered nurses for healthcare assistants. They found that the nurses wanted to do a good job but did not have time or perhaps the training to do so, and in particular they needed to be supported to have the time and opportunity for further training and skill enhancement. The Colin Tome Review, the next one. Over-reliance on process measures, targets and striving for foundation trust status at the expense of quality services for patients. They recommended, this report recommended, they involve patients and the public, uh, that outcomes should be supported by excellent use of appropriate data and information, that they should ensure governance and accountability of all different organisations in the system and there should be better clinical leadership. You can see the themes starting to come through. So what happened then? They got all this into these reports and these recommendations. The trust got together and said, OK, we'll, we'll employ more nurses. So they ended up with a net gain of 46 nurses and 51 healthcare assistants. They increased the number of matrons from 3 to 12. Now, the modern matron initiative was brought in in the UK when I was living there. And um, it's really a name for the middle-level nursing management. Uh, it would be probably equivalent to our um, nursing directors here at Townsville Hospital. Why they've hung on to the word term modern matron is absolutely beyond me, and I don't know how the men who hold that, those positions, and there's many of them. I don't know how they live with that, but anyway, they do. But in November 2008, recruitment to these new positions stopped because of financial pressures, and there were still 40 nurses needed. They set up a steering group for emergency care. They improved training for junior doctors. They implemented the use of early warning systems. They gave the nurses training on monitors. They brought in new beds and opened a theatre and they put in tracking systems for incidents. Then, the Mid-Staffordshire Trust invited people with concerns about the care they or a relative received at the Trust to request an independent clinical review. And this led, in 2009, the Secretary of State for Health announced an independent inquiry because there were so many complaints that kept coming in. And in the introductory letter to the preliminary report of this written inquiry, by, chaired by Robert Francis QC, and this is the preliminary report after they'd done it for a year, and he said, the overwhelming number of accounts given by those affected should surely put to rest the views, still harboured by some, that the Health Care Commission's report was painted an unfair picture of how the trust was performing. There can no longer be any excuse for denying the enormity of what has occurred. The full and final report, and you can see the size of it, was published on the 6th of February 2013. Again, public document. It's all out there, very easy to access and have a look at, but it's not pleasant bedside reading. This inquiry, this was the fourth inquiry, remember, and this was the biggest, it in included representatives from Mid Staffordshire Trust, the Primary Health Care Trust and the Strategic Health Authority. It looked at documentary material, some primary material that had been collected by the Health Care Commission audit, 966 members of the public, 82 staff, past and present, professional bodies and patient interest groups such as this one uh, that's come up called Q of the NHS. Now, there's a letter to the Minister at the beginning of this report, written by Robert Francis. He found that this very much summarises what he concluded. He found a culture focused on doing the systems business, not that of the patients. An institutional culture which, which ascribed more weight to positive information about the service than to information capable of implying cause for concern. Standards and methods of measuring compliance which did not focus on the effect of a service on patients. 
too great a degree of tolerance of poor standards and of risk to patients, and a failure of communication between the many agencies to share their knowledge of concerns. Assumptions that monitoring, performance management or intervention was the responsibility of somebody else. A failure to tackle challenges to the building up of a positive culture, in nursing in particular, but also within the medical profession. And a failure to appreciate until recently the risk of disruptive loss of corporate memory and focus resulting from repeated multi-level reorganisation. Is this ringing any bells? <laughs> So that's what it was all about. What I've done next is look at the recommendations related to nursing. There were many, many recommendations. There's pages and pages of them in the executive summary alone. But for our purposes, I looked at the ones that re were related to nursing. Now, nursing came out looking the worst in all of this. One of the problems, I think, is that nobody differentiated between the people who were nurses and the people who were healthcare assistants. And remember that healthcare assistants are brought in off the street and given a job with no prior training, no knowledge, no nursing skills. They're just pairs of hands. They wear similar uniforms to the nurses, so it's very difficult for anyone to be able to work out the difference between the two of them. And most patients probably wouldn't know whether they were being looked after by a nurse or a healthcare assistant because they all look the same. And they're expected to do similar things to a certain extent, or to a much larger extent than should be, than is appropriate, I would argue. So page 76 to 77 of the executive summary had these recommendation, recommendations for nursing. The ones in red are the ones I've pulled off, I'll elaborate on further uh, in a minute. So the first one, there should be caring, compassionate and considerate nursing. Now, isn't it awful that someone has to recommend in a major inquiry that we need considerate, compassionate and caring nursing? So they said there should be an increased focus on a culture of compassion and caring in nurse recruitment, training and education. Nursing training should ensure that a consistent standard is achieved by all trainees throughout the country. The achievement of this will require the establishment of national standards. The knowledge and skills framework should be reviewed with a view to giving explicit recognition to nurses' commitment to patient care and the priority that should be accorded to dignity and respect in the acquisition of leadership skills. There's a couple of points with this one. Firstly, look at the use of the word training. British nurses always talk about doing their training, whereas it's not training anymore, it's education. You go to university, you get an education, you don't do your training. But the culture persists in using the word training, which I think does not help nursing or nurses understand their own status. I think culturally it's an inappropriate term, but it's continued to be used right across the UK. And when you look at this, what on earth is going on when nursing has to be told that they should have uh, as national standards about compassion and caring. It just, it's just <laughs> blows me away to think that it's gone that far. The next recommendation was, was there should be practical hands-on training and experience should be a prerequisite to entry into the nursing profession. <laughs> I wonder what that means. Carry on. David's the expert. Beauty. Okay. <laughs> sound. Where's sound gone? Volume? Ah. How's that? That better? That working? I don't know. It's all right? Okay. Right. The next one was training and continuing professional development for nurses should apply at all levels from student to director and commissioning arrangements should reflect the need for healthcare services to be delivered by those who are suitably trained. Makes you wonder where the healthcare assistants sit in this. 
Uh, nurse leadership should be enhanced by ensuring that ward nurse managers work in a supervisory capacity and are not office bound. They should be involved and aware of the plans and care for their patients. The Nursing and Midwifery Council, which of course is the same as our APRA, should introduce a system of revalidation similar to that of the General Medical Council as a means of reinforcing the status and competence of registered nurses, as well as providing additional protection to the public. It is essential that the NMC has the resources and the administrative and leadership skills to ensure that this does not detract from its existing core function of regulating fitness to practice. There should be a responsible officer for nursing in each trust and they should be accountable to the NMC. It's an interesting one. The next one was that consideration should be given to the NMC to introduce an aptitude test to be taken by aspirant registered nurses prior to entering into the profession to explore the candidate's attitude towards caring, compassion and other necessary professional values. Once nurses have received appropriate training, the NMC should ensure the professional development of registrants and should ensure that nurses' training is more practical. The special requirements of caring for the elderly should be recognised by consideration of the introduction of a new status of a registered older person's nurse, which isn't... That's an interesting idea. They gave the Royal College of Nursing a real, um, a real shove. And certainly my experience of the Royal College of Nursing was that it was an absolutely toothless tiger. Uh, very much an industrial body, like our QNU, uh, but represented itself very much as a professional body. And so, um, but you know, for example, when I was living there, 20,000 nurses across England lost their jobs. And the, the biggest objection that the RCN raised was a paragraph on its website saying this, isn't, this shouldn't be happening. And that was the most vocal they were over these nurses, so many nurses in England losing their jobs. So they gave the RCN a serve that should consider how better to separate its trade union and professional representative functions. A forum of nursing directors should be formed. There should be at least one nurse on the executive boards of all healthcare organisations. The advice of the nursing director, Val's going to love this one. The advice of the nursing director should be obtained and recorded in relation to the impact on the quality of care and patient safety of any proposed major change in nurse staffing or facilities. Now, that was the nursing recommendations. We'll go back to them in a minute. But it is now uh, moved on. And it is still happening. On the 27th of July 2013, there's another 14 hospitals in the UK under, or 14 trusts under similar investigation. And just uh, this month, a couple of days ago, 27th of January 2014, patients' lives at risk in NHS hospital wards on brink of collapse due to critical shortage of out of hours, out of hours doctors and growing numbers of the elderly. And uh, 19th of January, hospitals with fewer wards, fewer nurses on wards than mid Staffordshire. And if, here's a um, quote from the opposition uh, health, a shadow health minister. It doesn't need an expert to tell us that a patient-to-staff ratio of 1 to 22 is unacceptable and dangerous. So things are not getting any better. NHS heading for disaster over lack of nurses um, because nursing training places are being cut even though record numbers of nurses are set to retire and the population is ageing. Now, some of the discussion around a lot of this has gone on over this business of nursing being nurses needing degrees. And it was this was going on when I was there. And it was it's been a fascinating argument to watch because there's a very strong movement in the UK for nursing education to go back to hospitals. People do not understand why nurses need such a high level of education. They just don't get it. And uh, there's stories about nurses being too posh to wash, um, ordered student nurses back to basics to improve compassion in NHS. And I, I can show you in a minute why, all, why I think all this is happening. But it, this debate is going on. There was a, 
Uh, Manette Marin is a writer for the Sunday Times and she wrote a piece in 2008, I think it was, saying that um, if they bring in degree education for nurses, that's going to stop a lot of people who'd make really good nurses not applying because it would actually stop people who, to be honest, aren't very bright. It would stop them applying for nursing. So this degree business is rubbish. Um, there was another one, Thomas Dalrymple, writing in um, the Daily Telegraph, saying that um, uh, nurses only wanted degrees because they wanted to improve their own personal status. It had nothing to do with patient care. So this debate has been going on for a long time and it is really very nasty and very prominent. Now, out of the Mid-Staffordshire scandal, the politicians, of course, got involved. The UK Minister for Health in 2013 came out and said, what nurses on the front line are saying, a lot of them, particularly the older nurses, is that this was part of nurse training. Why would you want to become a nurse if you were unwilling to spend time washing patients, feeding patients, doing that really vital experience on the front line? And then David Cameron came in. Nurses should spend some time when they are training as healthcare assistants in the hospital really making sure that they are focused on the caring and the quality and some of the quite mundane tasks that are absolutely vital to get right in hospital, the Prime Minister said. I think what the government is saying today, that all nurses in training should spend time caring for patients, is a good step forward. Right. <laughs> now, you can, see, you can see what this scandal has brought out in the UK. It's really highlighting absolutely major, major problems with nursing and with the National Health Service. The National Health Service was a brilliant idea when it was set up back in 1946. It was set to provide high-quality health care, free at point of delivery, universally to everybody. It was a marvellous, marvellous idea. But nobody in 1946 could have foreseen the burgeoning technology, the development of healthcare as we know it today, the major costs, the complex management systems. We all know what it's like. And, but nobody back in 1946 could ever have imagined it would get to be like it is today and get to cost as much. So, but as a result of that, every person in the UK believes that it is their right to have free healthcare to the highest standard. And they get very upset when you suggest that they, a private system might help, uh, might help bolster the way that the whole system. They really do not like the idea of private health care. It's slowly creeping in. But uh, when we were there, only 1% of the population held private health insurance. So it, it's a God-given right and very much an ingrained part of British culture. Now, nursing in the UK, how it all fits in that, fewer than 10% of nurses in the UK have a degree. However, in, they're all in, um, educated to diploma level. To get into the diplomas in the universities, you need only five GCSE passes. That's five grade 10 passes. And you don't even have to have a high level pass. You just need five GCSEs. And so the standard of students coming in was very poor. There were some studies done to show that some of them were enumerate, some of the nursing students in universities were enumerate and some were illiterate, but they were still getting through. In 2013, the Nurse Nursing Midwifery Council declared that a degree would be required for registration. By 2013, sorry, a degree would be required for registration. However, when David Cameron was being elected, his election platform was that nurse training would go back to hospitals. Now, I believe that the NMC have pushed forward with that. I don't know how far down the track they've got, but I know that colleagues were converting the diploma courses to degree-level courses. Some of them weren't very um, happy about the standards that they were having to meet, and some of them have actually commented to me that the standards for the degree courses wouldn't meet the standards for degree courses in other disciplines. They were being made to push them through. There's been much media and public discussion about nurses who are too posh to wash and people say it is all the fault of, nurse, of university education. But what people in the UK don't realise is that there is a massive flaw in their argument because problems are more likely due to the low standard of education in nursing courses rather than university education per se. 
So they've blamed it all on nurses going into university. It's all fault. Bring back the, the matron, bring back Florence, bring back Hattie Jarks and, and the, the militant matron who told everyone what to do. And people genuinely believe that's why that, that should happen. It's very scary. The status of nurses in the UK isn't very high. A registered nurse's beginning pay is about 23,000 Australian dollars, whereas in Queensland it's about 55, 56. But, but the status of nursing is very different to Australia. There are low expectations held by the public. Oh, nurses are those lovely ladies who put you on and off a pan and um, they will help you and they'll hold your hand. But there's absolutely no idea of the level of knowledge held by nurses. Nobody realises, the general public as a rule, just do not realise that nurses are highly educated or should be highly educated and need a lot of knowledge. Other disciplines don't help. Medicine still sees nurses as the uh, handmaiden, as their handmaiden. They really do. Um, and the expectations of management, as you can see from Mid Staffordshire, the expectations of management for the role on, as to the role of nurses is not very high. And the skill mix in the UK is very different to Australia. And let's hope it stays that way, because the more healthcare assistance they bring in, the more scared I get that it's going to happen here. And on to this topic of healthcare assistance. And these pictures here, they're all healthcare assistants, but how would you tell the difference? Why would you know that they're healthcare assistants and not nurses? They just look the same, they wear very similar uniforms. Um, the health nurses and healthcare assistants are there 24 hours a day. They're the most commonly seen health worker. So it's not surprising that in the Mid Staffordshire report that they were the ones most commonly complained about. Now, I've given a very negative picture, but there are some good things that come out of the NHS. They have very good systems of risk management. They ha they're great at writing policies and, and documents and plans, and they have some fabulous websites. There's some fantastic, universe, uh, some, some fast, fantastic nursing leaders in the UK. And I have to say, the nurses who go to the universities where there is a high standard of degree education are really very good. Places like um, Manchester, Birmingham, um, Hull, uh, or the degree course in Hull. Um, and Scotland and Wales have always held on to their degree courses. It's only in England that they've retained the diplomas. The health visitors are a, uh, nurses with a degree in um, community uh, health, community nursing. Health visitors are brilliant. They are really very, very good at what they do and their education is highly specific, very specialised and very good. But in 2006, they wiped out, in those cuts across England, they wiped out nearly all the health visitors. So one of the most successful, useful programs in the NHS was wiped out. They're now madly trying to re-employ the health visitors. In the UK, they're very good at recognising the importance of history to nursing, which, of course, is one of my soapbox items. I think it's vitally important that we know our history and because it informs what we do today. But the UK are very good at recognising the history of nursing there. And the universal health care provided by the NHS is a good idea. It's not divided up into states where everything's different. It is universal across the country. So on to nursing in Australia. And as I said, I, I definitely think we are really, really good at what we do. We have some of the highest standards, the best education, great research, really good stuff happens here. But we have to be very aware and be um, cognizant of the idea that things could change here if we let our standards slip. And there are things that have gone wrong. Um, just the media in the last few couple of years. 2011, um, nurses have been sacked from a nursing home for allegedly depriving a dying man of food and playing with his genitals, anyway. Uh, hospital under fire after a woman delivers own baby. You've probably all heard about that. Um, at Blacktown Hospital. The media loved it. It's interesting, isn't it? They've got nurses, but the midwives haven't, haven't been put in that picture anywhere. 
Um, but if you look at that, so don't think, of, and of course we all know about Bundaberg, which, okay, Dr Patel was probably the main problem there and uh, he copped the most blame, but it was very much a systems failure across the whole health service. So we can't forget these things and we can't think it can never happen here because it can. But if we look at the Francis report and see what Australia already has got, if we look at the recommendations of the Francis report, we, have a, we already have a consistent standard of nursing education throughout the country and national standards with ANMAC and, and APRA. Training and continuing professional development for nurses at all levels is available, is encouraged, is supported. Um, a question, of course, has to be, does everyone have access to this? And people who are working in rural and remote areas might question this. But the, the opportunity is there and it's freely available to us. We have a system of revalidation with APRA and ANMAC. And you know, we, we can't be complacent. We have to question, could it be done better? There's a forum of direct nursing directors. We're not quite sure. Certainly Queensland has a forum of nursing directors. Does this happen in other states, Val? Mm. Um, nurse on, nurses on executive boards. Well, this is an interesting one because in Queensland they, <laughs> they have to have a nurse. It has been mandated now that there must be a nurse on every one of the hospital boards. Um, as most of you know, I was on it for a while but uh, pulled off for various reasons. Uh, and I don't think they've replaced me on the board yet, but they're going to have to. So, because it's now mandated, there has to be a, nursing, a nurse on all the hospital boards, so nursing has a voice. Francis recommended that there be a nurse on the executive boards. Um, I would suggest that this is very much under threat at the moment in Queensland too. Ipswich and Gold Coast Hospital have got rid of their executive directors of nursing and uh, their uh, medical directors. And I think we should be very afraid. Um, and Mari McAuliffe and I are about to do something about that. <laughs> We're going to start a petition um, to send to the Health Minister to ask that the role of Executive Director of Nursing and Executive Medical Director be upheld in Queensland. So watch out for the petition. Mari and I will be sending it around this week. So please all sign it and get all your friends to sign it as well. If we can stop that happening in Queensland, we can preempt it happening here in Townsville. That's the plan. Um, the really interesting one out of the Francis report was getting the advice of the nursing director if there's any proposed major change in nurse staffing or facilities. Well, I would say God help anyone who tried to do that in Australia without getting the approval of the nursing director. But if we haven't got a nursing director, that could be a problem. What, some of the things out of the, a couple of things out of the Francis Report Australia could adopt. The responsible officer for nursing in each health, each health area accountable to APRA, uh, which would probably be a good idea if we had a rep in, in North Queensland who was a rep for APRA that would make life probably a lot easier for some of us. And a specialist older people's nurse is an interesting one. Just something to think about. So the lessons for Australia out of all of this, um, and these are the ones I found that uh, were very challenging within the Francis Report recommendations. Increased focus on culture of compassion and caring. How the hell do we do that? I really don't know. Health care services to be delivered by those who are suitably trained. Where does that leave health care assistance? Ward nurse managers work in a supervisory capacity and are not office bound. What does that mean? I don't know any ward nurse managers who aren't um, clinically engaged. They know what's going on in their areas. The professional development of registrants, ensuring that nurses' training is more practical. This was an interesting one. <laughs> says it all, doesn't it? This was an interesting one for uh, the Francis report that the government picked up on over there, that um, people should, be, should work for six months as a healthcare assistant before they enter nursing training. And I just 
I don't know how you do that. I don't know why they would see that as particularly valuable, except it's a cheap way to get your ward staffed. And an aptitude test to be taken by aspirant registered nurses prior to entering into the profession to explore the candidate's aptitude towards caring, compassion and other necessary professional values. I find that very challenging and very questionable. How on earth do you measure caring and compassion? How do you work out with an aptitude test if someone's going to be a good nurse or not? Um, the Royal, remember, this paper was presented at the QNU conference and their comment about the Royal College of Nursing should consider whether it should formally divide its Royal College functions and its employee representative trade union functions between two bodies rather than behind internal Chinese walls was the recommendation. But I think here we've probably got it pretty right. The Queensland Nurses Union and Australian Nursing Federation are very active, very good um, industrial bodies. We have the Australian College of Nursing and specialist organisations and colleges for all the different specialties. So we're pretty well balanced with all of that. But it's our responsibility as nurses and as individuals to engage with these, these organisations, to join and become active or at least interested in them. They are very important. They are very, very good for us, but we must support them. Now, there's something going on in Queensland that makes me feel very afraid at the moment. What's happening is that... Um, People from boards from around Queensland, it's not happening just here, it's happening all around Queensland, are going to the NHS and recruiting people at very senior levels to come and work here. And I think possibly people from the NHS would A, do, have something to offer us that's different, but B, it's really good for them to come and work here too and learn how a really good health system works so that they can go back to the UK and help the ailing NHS once they've learned here how a really good system works. What are you laughing at? <laughs> it's true. It's true. But what's happening when people come here is they come here not understanding that Australia is different. Australia's healthcare system is very different to the NHS and Australian nurses are much more highly educated, have a much higher status, and they have a much higher degree of autonomy in their practice and in their work than nurses in the UK do. People coming here from the NHS often think that nursing in Australia is the same as the UK, and it's not. The other thing that you have to bear in mind is that um, people coming from the UK, certainly in senior positions, come with the baggage of the class system that pervades all of British culture. It is very prominent. It is very alive. When you live there for a while, you realise what's going on. It took us a while to work out what was going on, but after a while we realised that everything is dominated by class. And it was very interesting. I read a book by an anthropologist from Oxford who studied the English, and her conclusion was that everything in the UK was dominated by class. And so people come here don't realise that that's not the same here in Australia and expect the class system to um, influence our way of thought and have trouble understanding what's going on when they're trying to get something done and it's not working and they, they don't realise that we're not talking the same language, we're not thinking on the same plane. So um, I think this is one of the problems that's occurring across Queensland. Um, one, of the, one of the big things in the NHS is this, influence, uh, this focus on targets. So it's a focus on outputs, but not the sequelae, the four-hour rule, the four-hour rule in emergency. You know, there are people in the UK being admitted to outlying holding wards that are not counted in the admission figures, after they've spent four hours in emergency, they're put there. They're not counted in the, emergency, in the admission figures because then that, that means that they've been moved out of emergency in four hours without burdening the rest of the hospital. Uh, let's hope it doesn't get to that here. 
The four-hour rule is a good idea in principle. Sounds wonderful, get people out of emergency within four hours. But when you think it through, is it always best for the patient? Wouldn't it sometimes be better if the patient stayed in there a bit longer? But this, this adherence to the four-hour rule is concerning. I have a concern over day admissions. Uh, we are all told that day admissions are the best thing for families, best thing for patients. They might be good for some families, they might be the best thing. But when we get little Johnny and take his tonsils out, poor Wendy's heard me rattle on about this forever, um, take his tonsils out and we give him back to the parents and we say, here's little Johnny, this is what you do, here's the number to ring and goodbye. And we don't ask them what impact it's having on the family. We don't ask them, are they taking time off work to look after little Johnny? Are they using up their holidays? How much is it costing them? What are they going to do if something goes wrong? We don't ask any of that. Uh, so Wendy and I are actually planning a research project around that. But this idea of day admissions, of pushing people through the health service, pushing them through the hospitals, is presented as something fantastic, but we really must question some of these things. And this focus on throughput, is throughput really the be-all and end-all of everything? Certainly it's, it has financial benefits because you're getting patients through and they're not staying for long periods of time. But some patients probably do need to stay longer. And the use of call and early warning systems, I think, has to be questioned too. We really must have a good look at that. These things all sound like really good ideas when you first hear them, but when they're implemented, what's, what's happening? Why, why do you find a nurse going tick, 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 oh goodness, it's in red, I'd better call a code without looking at the patient? You know, but we're losing, we're giving away our clinical judgment, we're giving away our critical thinking abilities by letting these things be put in place. Um, now, I do believe it's best to try and um, get on with people. So what we have to do with these people that are coming from the NHS and trying to present these ideas is not to get upset with them, but to work with them and try and let them get them to understand that it's very different here. It's not like it is in the UK. So we're best to work with them, not against them. Now... Staff shortages, it's predicted that we'll be short 190,000 nurses by 2025, which is really scary when you're my age, because I'm going to need them. In the UK, they've got healthcare assistants filling the gaps. In Australia, we hope we're going to have more and more assistance in nursing. It's a reality that we're going to need people to care for us. If we have assistance in nursing, they're valuable members of the team because they are nurses, they have to work under a registered nurse. Healthcare assistants may probably, well, they will answer to someone outside nursing. They'll answer to someone corporate or they'll answer to someone managerial, gen generically managerial. They may not answer to the registered nurse, but the registered nurse is still legally responsible for what goes on in his or her area. So. This is something we really must stick to our guns about. We don't want healthcare assistance. We want assistance in nursing because we've got some measure of control over what they do, who they answer to, and how much training they get. But an assistant in nursing is not a substitute for an enrolled nurse or a registered nurse. So we really must push these messages. There was much made in the Francis report and the whole scandal about this thing we call basic care. And it's because people do not understand that basic care is anything but basic. It's something that all nurses do, but people are not good at understanding, or they really don't get the idea that when you're putting someone on a pan or giving them a shower or whatever, you're not just putting them on a pan. You're assessing them, you're looking at their skin, you're looking at how they move, how they breathe, you're talking to them, finding out what's going on in their family. We all know this. Roger Watson suggests we call it essential care, not basic care. Melanie and I have a paper on the go about this because we both really got upset about this whole talk of basic care. And I was actually on the ABC last week rattling on about it too. So I really want to educate the world about this stuff we call basic care, or maybe we should call essential care. But it's this basic understanding that lets people think 
but healthcare assistants can do what we're doing. And it's this basic misunderstanding in the UK that's coming over here from the NHS. Now, I think our public-private healthcare system in Australia is probably about right. We've got a good balance. Uh, you know, people like me who can afford to pay private health insurance does so, and that way I don't burden the public health service, which means it's accessible to people who, can't, who aren't as well off as I am, basically. But if I get cleaned up in a car accident tomorrow, I know and really need some really good intensive care. I know I can be brought here, get intensive care, and I know I'll get the best care possible. So I think we've got that safety net, we've got that balance really, really well. With what's going on in government in Queensland at the moment, I think we should be aware of be, should be beware of selling off the good bits. Should we give anything over to the private sector and beware this term contestability, which in other which translates to privatisation. So when you see talk about that, think about it and question it. And Beth Mole from QNU says the private hospital sector performs an important role but as a complement to the public system, not a replacement for it. So we can't let the, the private system be given the wonderful stuff that we've got in the public system because eventually it will mean we'll end up like America and it won't be accessible to all. People will miss out. Um, there's been this idea of expanding nursing roles. Now, in the UK, there are nurses who do varicose vein and hernia operations advanced practice nurses. Some of them are called nurse practitioners. They don't have the qualifications of our nurse practitioners. They don't need a master's degree. Uh, they're given on-the-spot, on-the-job on the training and they're sent in to do these things. I would say that they're being conned into doing jobs doctors don't want to do and I would actually question whether it's part, a legal part of their scope of practice. And I think if really you want to do all those things, you should just go and do medicine. It's not a part of a nurse's role, and it puts both patients and clients and nurses at risk. Um, public expectations, I've talked about that, and I think it's up to us to educate them. We should all be getting out and talking about what it is nurses do and use. Let's, let's engage all our 14, 15-year-olds and get them to show us how to use the social media so we can educate the world about what it is nurses really do. And we should be talking to Women's Weekly and the ABC um, Kirsten, where are you? Kirsten's on the ABC tomorrow morning, folks, 10 o'clock, local, <laughs> local radio. And Nikki's doing it in May. So we're putting across some of the really good nursing research that's going on in North Queensland. Anybody want to do it? Just let me know. Um, but I think a lot of this and our acceptance of what's happening in Queensland at the moment particularly in relation to the Mid-Staffordshire report, is that we all still suffer from the cultural cringe. We all still believe that anything that happens in Australia is not as good as anything that happens from other countries. And I think that is just so erroneous. It's, it's just <laughs> untenable. We are, as I said, we are really good at what we do. We must have faith in ourselves. We are better than many, many countries and many, many places. Nurse, Australian nursing is one of the world's leaders. We do things really well. We can't let this cultural cringe dictate how we think. Donald Horn um, wrote The Lucky Country in 1964, and basically it was a book about how Australia should grow up and stop, cut its apron strings to, uh, or its, its umbilical cord to the UK. Uh, he said that Australia is a lucky country run by second-rate people who share its luck. A country that does not think for itself, is manacled to its past and is still in colonial blinkers. He said, if we are to remain a prosperous, liberal, humane society, we must be prepared to understand the distinctiveness of our own society. And I think we can translate that to nursing. If we, Australian nursing are to remain a prosperous, liberal, humane profession, we must be prepared to understand and celebrate the distinctiveness of our own nursing society. I think I really do believe we should be doing that. And if we can do that, we can uh, live up to the expectations of some of these wonderful Queensland nursing heroes. And that's it. And I'm really happy to answer any questions if I can.